Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of What Did He Said Podcast. It's your boy Chingo Bling. We got the homie Juan Perez in the building. What's up? What's up? Yeah, man. It's good to be back, man. Uh, back to podcasting. Uh, I'm recovering because we had an amazing weekend in H-Town, my hometown. You guys packed it out, sold it out during Chili Cook-Off. And for anybody watching this outside of the Houston area, rodeo time, Chili Cook-Off, I'm talking about like... It's it's up there, bro. It's a big deal. Yeah, and, fuck uh, your chili. Say it again. <laughs> I said fuck your chili. Yeah, no, it's a it's a big <laughs> deal, bro. Um, it's a big deal. No, did I say chili cook off? Yeah. Well, I said fuck your chili. I don't know. I might have said chili. It's not. It don't got nothing to do with chili, man. Oh, okay. It's, uh, it's rodeo cook off. So okay. it's just a huge party, right? And um, so I know a lot of people weren't able to make it to the show because because of rodeo cook off, but a lot of you guys did. So we really really appreciate you guys. Slam shows, and of course, the tour is off to a great start. Are We Still Friends tour. Uh, real quick, man, before we get to talking about everything that's going on all over the place, because we want to talk about SNL. But uh, I will be in Canyon Lake, Texas uh, on the 2nd, uh, pull up that Saturday, and then Lubbock on the 3rd. All right? So we'll tell you about more dates later. Yeah. But it was a great show, man. I, I Man, I had fun. Uh, you know, the first day... Uh, the first shows, the first two shows, uh, it w the lineup was 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 Jesse, Theo Juve, uh, Danny, the homeboy Danny Guerrero showed up, and then after that Javi. it was Javi, and then Chingo closed out the show for both shows, and then on the second night, uh, you know, we changed things up a little bit, and it Jesse. was Jesse, Juve. Theo Juve, me, and then it was uh, Chingo. Javi. So some so, uh, Javi and then Chingo. So just in case some people were like, "Where was Juan?" I didn't yeah, see yeah, it. Yeah. yeah, there's we we. Danny came out and and I decided to just let him have both shows because like you know we were gonna switch off but I was like man he's he's here it's his hometown let him just do both shows for you. yeah he was there the next day too so uh, yeah, that was cool. he showed up that was cool yeah man um, my boy Buns pulled up he's a he's a rapper from here and uh, we got a dope song coming bro. We're just waiting. Yeah, you hyped this up. Yeah, too. No, I, now dope. when Chingo told me, I was like, man, like sometimes he yeah. was like, "Hey, bro, it's all." Hey, yes. cause, cause, I was like, "Damn, hey, I want to hear it now." Because I just remember a little piece of my verse. It was like, "Sock check, homie, what it do? What it do? From the same city as DJ Screw, DJ Screw, and it just starts going." But uh, oh, you haven't even told him the, the reason I'm hype about that song because I I don't know anything about that song. Oh, like, okay. Chingo hasn't told me nothing, but he did tell me about the Theo Hoover song and he sent me a little clip of it. And I'm like, dude, bro, I, I got it, man. Theo Hoover dropped songs. some gas, dude. Yeah, Theo Hoover. I like I like how his verses came out. Bro. He did his thing. So we definitely want to shoot a little video to that. Uh, we would definitely want to set it up properly. We want the artwork to be dope and everything for him so that you guys could uh, really enjoy it to the maximum. Yeah, we want to have a proper rollout for it, and we want to have the right kind of music video and everything. But man, this song—it's for all the Sancho's out there. All you Sancho people gonna just—I'm a cliente, oh, kind of suit, just a Sanchopreneur. Mommy, how you doing? Oh, dude, like, that's so rate bad. the Chile five service. <laughs> uh, what do you say? Rate the Chile five star service. I provide. <laughs> Chingo gave him an opportunity to get up in the booth, and Theo Hoover just like he slung his chili yeah. out. Yeah, nah, dude, I'm, I'm I'm excited about that <laughs> song. And here's the thing, bro. When you, when you're an independent artist and you got like the internet stuff like that, I plus you kind of know my personality, so I tend to like not jump the gun, but I get so excited that I want to like hurry up and release stuff. And um, when a lot of times in in like the music business, especially when you're operating at a certain level, like major labels, there's yeah. you're dealing with millions of dollars and all these different people in conference rooms and all this crap. Right. So obviously. They want to make sure that when Mariah Carey drops or Eminem or whoever, like they got everything. They've already had 50, 55 meetings and budgets and everything else. Well, sometimes I, I feel like maybe I'm being too hard on myself, but sometimes I feel like like, damn, bro, if if you had just rolled stuff out a little bit differently, sometimes, you know, maybe if you would have went right set of left on some of these situations. But it's so hard to tell, bro. So sometimes you do just have to pull the trigger and and uh, what is it? Perfect is the enemy of good. Like perfection you, is the enemy. Yeah, of perfection is the enemy of good. So you wanna you wanna be able to iterate and release and stay creative and and, and I think well, you see, this is the thing though. Like you're doing it. Like, you got to think of it like on a small business perspective. Like you're literally like a small business going up against like the corporation of like the industry of music and stuff. And sometimes that's even better because now you have creative freedom. 
you can put it out however you want. And I know some guys put that off. Like they're, they're saying a lot of that stuff just to like, hey, man, I'm putting it on YouTube because it's creative. And sometimes yeah. it's like, bro, you don't even have a following to do yeah, something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. But we're, you've literally had, you've literally been your whole career that way. You know, you own your masters and everything like that. And, you know, sometimes that's actually good because that gives you more creative freedom to be like, oh, man, I'm, I think I'm going to drop it this way. And, it, and sometimes it comes out way better. Like, like just a perfect example would be like the movie Deadpool. I, I don't know if you've seen it, but like the yeah, yeah, first yeah. one that ever came out, bro, it was the lowest budget movie, right? Out and of all it, the Deadpools. Out of all of them, out of all of the Marvel movies and everything. And it, it hit the hardest. And then whenever they put money behind it and stuff like that, it lost quality because they had to be creative with how they were going to tell the story and they had to do it just right and they had to pitch it just right. And uh, same thing with like, uh, think about Joe Coy. When Joe Coy put out like his his special, he filmed it all. He put all his money behind it instead of having a big corporation and all these different things out all of it. All the shots. And then he filmed it. They bought it and then they put it out. But really, he's the one that made the creative decisions because he knew what, what was going to hit harder. He had the right set and he put everything else behind it and it just came out magnificent. That happens with a lot of creativity where yeah. when you start getting the businesses into it, sometimes it like it, it makes takes, everything yeah. fucked yeah. up and it, and it, like they just put too much money into it whenever they take a lot of the criti- uh the, the creativity out of it and it, it it can dilute the actual product and you do it like seamlessly. So I mean I, I think what we're doing with Theo Hoove and and how we're doing the shows and stuff like that, working on these little things and making tweaks here and there and then just putting out the products and we're getting stronger at the at the content itself. It's making everything amazing. I think that, so just doing it off of that, we're like honing in every little skill based on how we're doing it. So, I mean, it all works out. That's the way I look at it. Yeah, it's all working out. So, yeah, I, I guess maybe I'll bring that up because since I got my old YouTube channel back, like I'll be on there replying to comments and stuff. And I've gotten to the point because the channel was, um, we recently got it back. So mm-hmm. I'm I'm like six years ago replying to comments from like six years ago we, <laughs> yeah. because the channel went away like what, four or five years ago. So anyway, yeah. I'm looking at some of the content, like some of the videos and I'm just tripping out going down memory lane thinking like, like I'll hear a rap or something on there that, that was on my old channel, like some cumbia remix of something. And I'll be like, like damn, that, it kind of stands the test of time. Some of it, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Like depending on what what song it is, I'll listen to uh, like what I said on there or or something. Um, so yeah, anyway. Yeah, and 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 also with that, it's the other thing is is that like with with the career that you had before and you had like switching lanes to from rap to comedy is it's there's a lot of different there's some parallels, but for the most part, it's so different that you were having to adjust and like bring your stock up on comedy on, like on stage and stuff and then now you're taking pieces from your rap game and putting it into here as far as like showmanship and the different creative pieces of like artwork and then also the the merch and stuff like that to where it's blending the two together now that you've raised your comedy level up it's like now you're adding these little pieces and then on top of that uh literally having me come on board and then catch up to where you were where you once were like as far as like with videography stuff like i'm having to i've had to learn these whole things and you took a chance on me and at the same time i've been able to learn and adapt to where it's like okay let's we can raise the quality on this okay let's mix this and and so i'm having to get up to the level that you used to be at in order for us to like really be successful with what we're doing and i think it's paying off it's just a matter of like we just had to figure that out and so your fans have been patient. Everybody else has been patient. We've gotten new followers now that you didn't have in the past. Mm-hmm. And it's just all kind of come full circle to where it's like, okay, we found our groove. And now we're just like, like edging it in even more, like making it, like making the groove even bigger. Like where it's like, okay, yeah, we can expand on this stuff A now. A culmination, carnal. Yeah. As mm-hmm. Hoover would say. But, uh, but yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate the fans so much, man. Uh, um, I mean, just the fact that we have an audience to where all the... We, all the silly stuff that that we make and and um and and then just coming at people from different angles you know what i mean to where like who they might say something that's off the wall but then you release a, a track with some people and when i did some podcasts in um in la last time i was out there yeah uh i think one one gentleman asked me he was like so did you ever get any pushback from other artists like not wanting to work with you just because you were on some silly stuff and i was like you know what i'm very grateful 
for the fact that I am able to uh, not be like a chameleon, but but have people see like, yeah, yeah, I know you do the silly stuff, but I know we can make something dope that people are going to want to check out. You know what I mean? And I know you're going to switch up what you normally would say on another track for this particular topic or whatever. So, so yeah, I say that because uh, uh, the homie uh, Buns, man, he's super talented, bro. You, you, I don't know. I got to show you some of his raps, but he's got raps for every beat. Multiple raps. That's the guy that came to the show. Yeah, yeah, oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Multiple. Yeah. The one I was dressed like, oh, Dude, cool, he Jay. was, he was, he was dying. I oh, he was, he had a good time. Yeah, he was watching the show from the side when you went out and, and watching some of the other show, bro. He was dying, had not half the stuff like, I because he was like real like serious in the green room, but yeah. then I was like, man, does this guy laugh? And uh, he came out and dude. When I saw him laughing his ass off, I was like, "Oh, we got him." <laughs> oh, well, that's well, that's good yeah. to hear because honestly, bro, I think that was his first comedy show, right? And he's he's from Rosenberg, uh, Buns Buns One Hundred. So, um, I I was concerned that he wasn't gonna have a good time because it was sold out. So he was having to stand like at a weird angle. So, well, I got him a chair. So the, I got a chair from the back and put us to the side. So he was sitting down for some of it, and then he was standing yeah. up. So yeah, I he guess, loved it though. Yeah, no, okay, well, good. Because I guess what I was trying to say is like it's different to experience the show as a. Um, a true participant like no i i stood in line i wa i bought a ticket i don't know i wasn't just in the green room you know what i'm saying yeah. whereas it's like it's almost like uh you're eating at a restaurant but you were just hanging out in the kitchen for 30 minutes and yeah. you know the chef and then you're sitting over here in the back eating yeah. with us not experiencing it with the candlelight with the waiter yeah so, it's a little bit of a different experience but yeah, yeah he got to enjoy the the laughs okay. but like i like but yeah if he actually comes to a show it'll probably be a lot better but like this was pretty cool too yeah i saw him laughing I saw awesome him laughing yeah man so uh super excited uh have i told you about cam bertrand yet have i told y'all yet oh well we yeah so we had something to switch <laughs> up where we, we we added somebody to a show and this guy okay if you guys don't know who cam bertrand is he's from florida he was on america's got talent or america's got talent yeah, right america's yeah. got talent um you know his his clip went viral and then Wait, which uh, clip was it the one from the one sh from the show oh he's got he's so his stand-up is on point and he's he's filmed a special on dry bar and and a few other specials he likes filming specials and putting them out so i think he has like two or three okay maybe so and uh he can do everything he can do clean comedy you know he could do whatever he needs to do he's so he's a master i'm like, looking forward to he's man. a young guy but he's just like a wizard bro how old is he he's in his 20s bro. are you serious I think, yeah i think so i think he's like if i'm not mistaken he's probably maybe maybe he's like 29 30 either way bro yeah, he's he, young he's yeah. still young even and if he's he is just that much of a talent well regardless of his age i mean i'm just so surprised that that he's that much younger than me <laughs> but uh Dude, iron sharpens iron. I, I'm just looking forward to working with him, watching him work. Um, I've only seen him live uh, once, but uh, he's about to blow up. He's about to be the man out here. So um, yeah, and uh, well, well you, did you tell him what the show he's gonna be on? Oh yeah, Canyon Lake, uh, Canyon Lake this Saturday, March second at Goofy's. Uh, Cam Bertrand. Yeah, dude, I gotta go with, like probably whip up a flyer or something real quick yeah we'll put it up um but yeah that's that's gonna be an amazing show it's gonna be with me you theo Juve, and cam bertrand yeah and yeah. it's it's i think our styles are all so different that it's gonna be like a crazy show yeah as i i'm i'm gonna enjoy it it's and a uh, shout out to jesse payton if y'all don't know who he is look him up he'll be with us and uh well we'll be co-headlining in lubbock texas at the office on sunday march 3rd uh, he killed it too out there in Houston, man. Oh yeah, he he murdered those those stages. Like he came out, he came with it, and uh, he brought the heat. Like that was it, fun shows, man. Fun shows. I mean, just so many different styles and stuff. I think we talked about it already, but like just the uh, the different styles you bring and the, and different things that you're doing with stand up and and have done in stand up. I think it's uh I think a lot of people that haven't gone to a show or thinking about going to a show. You're gonna be surprised. Like you're just gonna be like, oh dang. Well, I saw Chingo maybe a few years back, and it's been crazy because, well, I've been with you for what two a years? Couple years. I've been yeah. here for a few years, and just in that time, because and Israel would tell me what uh one of my homies he would tell me that like he's like, man, dude, Chingo has come a long way from when I first saw him, and I was like, oh yeah. He's like, he's like, yeah, bro. He, he found his thing with the the stuff he talks about, and then. 
when I've only seen him, for, for seen you for two years and meeting you in Corpus and then going from where you are now, it's like you've made some jumps. And even even Israel would tell me uh, when we were at the house, like you have made huge jumps from when he first saw you, like humongous. And so the fact that you're able to learn and, and, and adapt really fast and then now come up with the new content that you have with your family and stuff, it just all has resonated. And uh, that's that's been impressive, dude. Thank you. Um, damn, I'm trying to figure out, like, damn, how bad did I do when Israel first saw me? Well, he said it was, it was well, okay, so <laughs> if, if you want to take some criticism, uh, sure. the, what it was was, like, he said, uh, you're like, you were funny naturally, but you leaned in a lot on, like, the, uh, like, like the, the catchphrases and stuff. Uh -huh. So that was, like, the crutch. But he said, now the material's caught up to even that, and now it's just, like, you've just gone to like a whole nother atmosphere to where it's like, it's not just placating to the fans. It's like literally like, no, your jokes are on point. Well, uh, well I like criticism, especially from people I trust. And, uh, so yeah, I definitely appreciate that. So all the time, cause I want to be coachable, man. I want you know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. I, I, I like to take direction. Absolutely. So definitely looking forward to this year. Uh, the tours off to a great start. Um, you know, we work with a lot of funny comedians, so and we get to go to some cool cities. And I'm super, super excited. I can't wait to to compile the actual up to date list because we just added like Gainesville, Florida, Tampa, Florida, Detroit, Michigan. Uh, I can't remember all the ones, but uh, but like cities that have been requested yeah, like a lot, so all over the map. So we're, oh, here's another thing, guys. Uh, just on that note. Take down this number. Uh, do you remember the number? 210-480-8626. Yeah, so take down that number. and 210-480-8626. Uh, <laughs> now, text that number, and it's not going to be a text back and forth, but what the, what you're going to do when you text that number, text your, uh, your name, your city, and the email, and what we'll do is that uh, we'll, we're taking we're taking a big old list, and we're just having our, our contact list, and what we're doing is... We don't want to be we don't want you guys to miss out when we're coming and stuff like that so we want to be able to make sure we take down um a lot of these cities where you're from and then when we do go out to that city or when we do book that city and we do have ticket links and stuff we'll start texting you in that area and let you know you know when we're coming out we'll we'll, we'll text you the uh, the flyers and everything just let your friends know and uh and then when you come out man we can't wait to meet you guys you know there's gonna be a lot of meet and greets at the at the clubs and stuff and and it's just gonna be a good time. So if you're if you're wanting to decompress, come out and just laugh and take your mind off things. Like that's what the shows are gonna be. The shows are gonna be fire. Like ask anybody that's gone to the shows. Uh, I think the only complaint was the the first show was like Theo Hoover could not make it. But oh, that, that was Brea. just yeah. That was just you know he was dehydrated. He's dehydrated, big dog. And you know <laughs> we'll make it up to you next year. But like it just what it just didn't happen you know yeah and uh but other than that i mean theo hoover is making it to the show so y'all yeah. got to come out and see we got a great show like in store for you guys yeah so like juan said 210-480-8626 that way you could get a friendly reminder like hey we got your info when we we're in lubbock we're coming back to lubbock or hey last time you were in midland you know got your info and we'll do some raffles some giveaways and, and make it worth uh, your while for sure yeah and, and that's really all we're going to use it for and again this is we're trying to make it as, as convenient as possible for you guys. It's going to be a lot of work because we're having to put all these numbers down and really put it into our little database type of thing. And it just, you know, we'll figure that out. But like we're trying to do make the experience as best we can for everybody that wants to go to a show. And when we're in your city, you know, we'll, we'll come out. And then also, if if we are not going to your city or we haven't gone to your city, if we get enough text for that city, we will figure something out and try to get out there, especially if we see that there's a there's a want for yeah. Chingo in certain cities. So if you give that number out to your friends that, you know, might want to go to a Chingo show in whatever city it could be in any state, we'll figure something out and try to put together a show. Dude, in a perfect world, man, I would love to be able to do like Canada, England, you know, politics aside, right? Because yeah, some yeah. of them countries got their little fair share of issues. But like Australia, anywhere they speak English, bro. <laughs> yeah. Notice I didn't say comedia en español porque la cago. Like, yeah. uh, I mean, yeah, it'd be cool to do something, but they pay in pesos. And, you know what I'm saying? They want your Spanish to be all perfect. And, you know, that's why I'm saying Canada, 
Well, UK. I don't see. I think you'd do good in Mexico because they wa- they follow and watch your stuff already, and there's already a percentage. Well, and we the we, expats always come out. All the Chicanos deportados. And not only that, but you got to think too. Like the reason why people in Mexico are watching it because they they think it's funny. Like yeah. especially when you're using your Tex Mex, probably they're probably like, oh, this is funny, and they probably fo- follow the like brutalizing. Because you have a big percentage in Mexico, bro. No, no crap. Hey, uh, do you remember my joke about uh, doing doing some shows in Mexico? I had like yeah, this yeah, huge yeah, chunk, yeah. man. I yeah, can't I believe it. that like that's totally gone. It feels like yesterday I was doing all that material about like my cousin calling me a mandilon. Yeah. All that was true story, bro. But um but yeah, that was a fun nerve-wracking experience, bro. Yeah. Because I felt like I was cramming cramming. Yeah. <laughs> but now now you got like a whole new set and it's it's crazy because it it was hard, but at the same time, if you think about the scope of how long it takes to do jokes and stuff like that, it was kind of easy because it was to the point where it's like, oh, I have this whole new chunk that we just we worked hard on it. But at the same time, we did it so fast and the jokes came out good to where they they, they hit and it could still be developed. But you're talking about the this uh, the new, recent time, the new recent time where it's like, oh, this little method of like writing it out, uh-huh. putting it on like open mic, a few open mics and then you just because you already had the idea and the concept and we had tagged it up and then now it's just like oh let me just get this down real quick and then you got it on stage and now all of a sudden it's like oh it's already almost like second nature to you because like you're just you're just hitting those marks so it's like damn that was fast yeah some of the I, i'll, tell, was pretty you, I'll tell you off air which which one i want to tinker with but uh but yeah when when you expose yourself like that like you go up on stage like at an open mic with something brand new that you're not 100 it's like um, when it's literally like a rehearsal like that. Right. You got to put your ego to the side and you got to already know, like, I'm about to get tapped out right now. <laughs> that's like yeah. the first um, that's the first metaphor that comes to mind where it's kind of like, all right, you're about to get like beat up in this class. But, you know, the metaphor would be like, but you get to demonstrate this move in front of a live audience later yeah because if you guys don't understand if you guys don't know or don't don't know how the comedy part works like if when you go to an open mic it's not like you have an hour to test out your stuff you literally get a few minutes so in that time frame uh when we were here we were literally having to figure out okay dude you got to stay in the pocket on that because i think the first time you went up you kind of like went off a little bit just bad you habits did, you yeah you did a little bit of crowd work just to keep people laughing but i was like dude we gotta you gotta stay in the pocket bro like you just gotta do it i know it's you're gonna bomb yeah but like stick, stick with the to story the so that we can try to get some rehearsals in of you just trying to do it and then hopefully something will come out of it where you might do crowd work within it but that might be a, a uh, another tag we just added to it like you know what i mean like stuff happens when you do it and like in just naturally so that's why i was like hey you got to go back out there and he i mean to chingo's credit we went to a second over mic i think the first night and then you were able to just change that real quick pretty quick the turnover was pretty and fast the next day then the next day it was like world different where it was like oh i just ran that through now we're back here and i just went over some tags and then the story came out and i was like there it is and then the next one got even better and then after that it was like show, I just had, I just show had, ready dog i just had to <laughs> redeem myself bro because yeah. it felt like i got like popped in the mouth and it's like you, you got to come back tomorrow though and yeah i get popped in the mouth so. and 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 see if, you, if you're not <laughs> like if you don't understand like how comedy works like and you've heard other podcasts that say like it takes years to come up with it really does so the fact that we were able to do like dude that was like a what that was like a 15 minute chunk 10 minute uh, chunk? i'd say it's about 10 minutes 10 chunk. minute 10 minute chunk that we were able to just get out real pretty quick and it came out pretty decent and then now you've taken it to another level already to where it's like, oh, it's show ready already. And then now if you want to tweak it to make it even better, we can. That, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. That's oh, it. man. Okay. Well, thank you, bro. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I've been having a good one, man. Just, uh, you know, going to church and trying to make it to jujitsu and just trying to, like, enjoy a little bit of home because I know we're going to be traveling a lot. And, um you know, I, I know you're going to be in San Antonio a lot Yeah, coming up. Yeah, a little bit more. Uh, just got some personal stuff I got to do. But other than that, I mean, we're still going to figure this out. We still got lots of, st- I mean, I got stuff in the vault. I still got to hey, put we'll out. meet at a Bucky's, homie. <laughs> yeah, we'll figure <laughs> meet it out. you halfway in a Bucky's. Um, but yeah, we just, I mean, that's what a lot of, the, but see, I, when I came down here originally, it was because we needed to start putting out material and stuff like that faster and with certain timing on certain things because i think that's whenever we started doing a lot of the nfl stuff and so we needed to crank stuff out pretty quick 
So that was one of the major factors in coming down here. And then also trying to figure out what else we needed to do and etch out because just times weren't lining up being, being away. I mean, being so much distance, but now that I've been here for like two years, I've, we've literally changed a lot of the stuff we did and took a lot of like the space between things out. And so now we took a lot of the slack out to where it's like, okay, we tightened up everything a little bit more like, uh, you know, running, running social media and stuff like that. And then also just like the podcast and trying to streamline it to where it's like super easy um, and, and versatile, meaning that, you know, we don't have to be at a specific place to do one thing. We literally yeah. figured out, okay, for sound and stuff like that, we, we could do this on the road. Like if we, as long as we have certain things, we do it on the road, keep the quality the same. And then also, you know, keep the content growing and stuff like that to where, you know, we've gotten to this point. And, and now that we can do things mobily and we can be more flexible with it. Now it's like, I don't really need to be here all the time. So that's, mm -hmm. it's, it's really been good. Oh well, yeah, man. Looking forward to this year for <laughs> sure. Looking forward to meeting you guys. Uh, the best feedback that, that, um, that I could possibly get is when I literally hear people say like, man, I've been going through some stuff, bro. It's been really rough. But, yo, that was a great show. Like, man, dude, I laughed so hard. My cheeks are laughing from beginning to end. I needed that. Thank you so much. So that's definitely what we're trying to do because we are coming to Florida. We are coming to Michigan. Um, I think I'm doing, like, Louisville, Kentucky, uh, possibly. That's uh, what's up. Don't quote me. Uh, and, of course, you know, I see some of these markets that uh, – they're like, I'll see like Baby Bash, you know, in New Jersey. And I'm like, Dad, it's been a while, man. I haven't really done that Northeast like that. You start to kind of get that itch. Or, you know, you see like, you know, Kim Flores. I was like, hey, bro, what's Philly like, bro? I mean, I I, I visited Philadelphia years ago, uh, like during school, but, uh, but not for comedy. So I'm like, man, what are the crowds like, bro? They got Mexicans out there. Mm -hmm. You know, I actually have a cousin who lives out there. But uh, Portland, haven't done Portland in years. Tacoma. I, I'm actually doing a weekend now in Tacoma. So uh, super looking forward to it. We appreciate you guys so much. Of course, this weekend is going to be lit with uh, Cam Bertrand and uh, Jesse Payton. Um, excited about that. Yo, Shane Gillis on SNL. Did you uh, oh, yeah. caught it when I it happened it. live or you saw the read? I saw the read because we were at the show during that day. Yeah. That I posted, That's but, right. But yeah, man, it, I, I think, what did you take? What was your take on it? Well, so far... Uh, I haven't watched the entire thing, but just the fact that the excitement alone. I just always watch the monologues. I don't even go through the whole thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the skits are sometimes the sometimes are good. Yeah. Like, did you see the one he did about the Trump shoes, the gold shoes? Uh, No. Like I, That was a good sketch. Like, I like I don't mind watching the sketches, but that's just for, just for like, anytime anybody's ever on SNL, I don't really watch SNL. So, like, I'll just watch, like, the, the monologues is all I really want to watch for the comedy comic i guess with shane it's a little different only because he's known for sketches like with his uh what is it called uh yeah gill and keeves yeah Keeve, or however it goes yeah gill yeah i, I think it's know. gill and keeves yeah gill uh, and Keeves. so I, that it's because he's known for sketches so i'm pretty sure that they were awesome but i just wanted to see the monologues because i like i feel like i can learn a lot about the comics with the monologues but go ahead uh, what did you think no i was just saying that like just the hype the buzz and anticipation alone is like probably a um, a big highlight for SNL because he's coming in from like that outlaw outsider world of like, oh, he's still raw and funny and he can still say inappropriate things. Mm -hmm. And he got fired from this place that's on a big network and it, it's got this whole legacy thing to it. So that combination of like, okay, they fired this dude. What is he going to say? Is he going to take the high road? Is he going to address that yeah. elephant in the, in the room? And, um, and then, like I said, I saw uh, some of the sketches. And, um, I mean, that the one about the Trump shoes, it was, like, well done. And I haven't really been a fan of a lot of SNL's content skits in a, in a long time. It's yeah. rare. It's, it's got to be one of those who are like, oh, Elon said this one thing. Or Dave Chappelle said this one thing. Uh, you know, so like me growing up, did you ever watch In Living Color? That's the one I would watch. That's okay, the one I grew up on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same here. So SNL, Mad TV and, and Mad TV and and uh, In, In Living, Living Color, Color were my things. Yeah, SNL had a little bit of a different flavor to it, but um, but yo, talk about. I, I just want to say this in, for this subject. Uh, it's a testament to like, bro, you can literally be at a point in life where you 
think this is your big break and then things go wrong and you're thinking, oh no, how am I ever going to get to that level again? And you could go a totally different path, like the world of podcasting and just stand up comedy and like everything that Shane Gillis is doing, like, like, um, podcasting, Patreon and like, um, I don't know if he if he did a Kickstarter or anything for his uh, sketch comedy, yeah. but to come full circle to where not only are you a, a player to where like, no, we meet again. We've crossed paths again. You're thriving. So uh, like with Shane, I, I don't know. Uh, so just to kind of go through all this with you guys, like just to show like what I took away from this with, with Shane Gillis is that like I'm a, the, he has a he has a big following and he's got a bunch of fans and like if if he would have never got fired from SNL, then we wouldn't have the the you know uh, Gill and Keeves uh, sketches, which are just raw and just amazing and just brilliant. So you want to talk about low budget? So it's like what we were talking about at the top of the show, which is like taking the idea and the art. And being able to just extrapolate like the best possible funniest thing we could possibly come up with without having to worry about pleasing the people with the money. I'm like, you can't put that on my network. Yeah, and the if he would have been with SNL, he wouldn't be able to have that creative freedom of just doing what he's doing. And now doing the sketches he's done, especially like on um, Patreon and you pay and you purchase that, that subscription. He is the one of two top paying uh paid patreons like he has numbers are like 80,000 uh, subscribers so he's got 80,000 subscribers the last time i think that was the peak and i think he's got the it's the highest paid uh patreon i could be wrong there could be one other one that's like neck and neck with him but 80,000 is like the highest patreon wow. he's he's leading the the charts with it so wow. i wonder how he promotes it and on top of that had he done good and stayed with snl he wouldn't have risen to the occasion as stand-up because most people that go into snl you know it it takes like especially with so comics, demanding. like you're so like you're always having to come up with creative ideas and sketches and he's built for it it's just he doubled down on his stand-up and he came out as a stand-up comedian his stand-up you know, he dropped a special at the Creek in the Cave, the first one, and it came out amazing. And then after that, he's just been going to the next level and the next level. He's already put out like two specials. And on top of that, he's done the sketches where it's taken the 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 Gill and Keeves. And he's just been killing it. And had he gone and, and done Got SNL, SNL, I mean, it would have only risen SNL stock. Of course, it would probably come out better for SNL. But it wouldn't have done him any justice. Now he's making all the money because it's yeah. lower budget on the on the Patreon. But the the creative freedom to do this stuff and why it's so you know successful is because it's their creative writings. Yeah, if he would have stayed at SNL, all his time, all his energy would have been sucked up, and he'd have been limited. Versus like, nah, bro, I'm my own brand. I'm calling my own shots. I got my own thing. Right, and now we have these jewels that he's dropping with everything. And then um, the other thing I took away from the SNL like monologue is the fact that, and I think I told I told you this before, but it was just like because I have somebody with Down syndrome in my family, and he talked about Down syndrome in his monologue. And some people are like, "Oh, that's messed up," because like he's making fun. He's like, "No, like he's literally taking a perspective." He made them human I and mean, made he, them he's human. Like, like I'm talking about, it, I could roast, I could talk. Right, and that's what people people now are always about their feelings emotions and they're like, always like how could you it, do I, that and we're gonna censor you and it's like dude he's like, he took a subject. subject and made it relevant to where it's like oh cool i see it in this light he took as an artist he took a chance because again you're on an snl it's not your fan base it's literally an snl crowd um very liberal crowd New York, and yeah. yeah where it's like oh don't touch that subject yeah, yeah, don't do that yeah, yeah. and so for him he took a big chance and on top of that he made the joke so good that it was like, damn, that was a good take on it and stuff. Whereas it was a good take, a good formulated joke, but to the point where when he said it, you're, you're, you're bringing up the subject. That's what some people don't think about. Like when you, when you're an artist or when you're a, like a, like a painter or something, or when you're a comedian or something and a musician, when you're taking a subject and putting it out there, you're putting it out there to raise awareness of it. And he did have, he does have a foundation for it. So it's like, he's literally bringing 
uh, awareness to his foundation on top of that he has people in his family so he's representing those things and he does have to make it funny so he's bringing out these little different jewels of like what that subject uh has to offer and then he put a spin on it with comedy and that's he did it in a masterful way yeah. where some people would have just like oh my god i can't believe you talked about that it's like no nah, he did that shit masterfully like that was good crafted jokes and on top of that he made it to where it's like you know i i, I was talking about like he, he had his uh his niece and he's like i talked about my niece on stage like when my niece gets older she could be like man he, freaking, he did yeah. that like you know what i mean because you're bringing yeah, it. the best line was when he was like um when he says you could tell when some people haven't had uh ex exposure to that yeah because they whatever whatever like and oh I, my god are they okay yeah, Is yeah, it yeah. gonna be okay <laughs> like, yeah. yeah cause because i remember growing up our next door neighbor uh rest in peace mm -hmm. uh, they had um you know little mikey next door and um and he was you know just a neighbor part of the family and and you you know see him coming and going and everything and say hello when you go visit and uh, uh okay go on. no that's it no because because uh, one of the major things with that is is this is what people don't understand when people don't talk about these things they get thrown to the wayside because i have family members that have like mental disabilities and stuff and um I have two aunts that have mental disabilities and they've never left the house. And so they didn't go to school. They, didn't do, they were always at the house. And so they didn't have school back then, like for, for kids with mental disabilities. Now we have programs and stuff in schools mm -hmm. that are actually catering to trying to give them some type of educational system. Like, and they also have some programs with like HEB that bring out some people with uh, people that are going to school with mental disabilities to do some bagging for um, some of the people and stuff so they're trying to get them out there but those programs are only available because some people have given them a voice to be able to be educated and to try to make them a part of society and so when we put them on comedy or we put them in some type of like our art form yeah. and we bring them up and we keep them as a topic up there and we're, we have a voice for them they're able to get out there and actually um and actually be able to be heard and not just like oh my god See. like we don't talk about them they're always like sheltered they're always the you know we don't want to talk about that part of our family it's like no no he shane is proudly saying i have a niece that's with it and he's making it loud and proud like you know what i mean and he even put himself as the in the joke too so where where people can look at it in a bad light y'all need to also look at the good part of like hey when a comedian brings it up to the forefront it's not that we're being malicious we're literally giving you a take on keeping that relevant so that you don't forget about those people and you can actually have these programs and different things like that but people need to look at it in Bro, those terms that crowd was way too tight like he yeah when he was talking about that he says he says I dodged it. He's like, no, he's like, it's in my family. He's like, but I dodged it. It nicked he's me. Like, it nicked it me. Nicked me. <laughs> but it nicked me. Yeah. And then. He's amazing. And, he, and then I think he might have said something like, oh, I thought that would have got a bigger pop. Yeah. I don't know if he, he said that a few times. And I'm thinking to myself, I was like, huh, I know I know you could blame the performance 99% of the time on the comic. Like, well, bro, you, you're supposed to pause a millisecond longer or whatever. Mm -hmm. But still, bro, it was kind of like. Either A, did they try to sabotage him with a weak ass crowd? Or B, I wonder if like the warm up act, like who was there to be like, nah, bro, it was just a weird casted. Well, you have audience. to look at, okay, so just um, let me just be geeked out here. But if you look at the, the, the different comedians that have been on, there are certain comedians that can play to that crowd because their crowds are similar to that. Shane Gillis's crowd, when he does his jokes and he has his fan base, his fan base are not that. So the same thing with like Obviously, certain yeah. Chappelle show, Chappelle and all these different ones. Like a few of them that have gone up and done certain uh, monologues, uh, Bill Burr, um, a few others. Like they wrecked the stage because their jokes are just that good. But yeah. like on some of those jokes, the laughter should have been bigger. But uh, because it's not their usual crowd and yeah. they're edgy, of course that crowd's not going to react to it. That's why I say it's uh, like it's a very different type of crowd in that and that's what people don't understand is like you might think like oh that joke kind of bombed it's like no no that was a perfect joke that was an amazing joke it's just that's not their crowd so those people are like oh am i supposed to laugh am i supposed to clap and that's why in those shows you also have lights that tell you to clap and stuff so that's why shane was like don't clap for that don't clap for that because he knows like the lights probably going off to clap and stuff like that and so there's there's all these different factors in show business that you have to look at but as far as if you just take out if you just take out the crowd and and don't go just for the 
laugh or the uh, applause breaks but understand like it was probably funnier in the moment only because his parents are probably literally right there so when he's talking to them it's because he saw a look that his mom gave him or his dad gave him and that's why some of those jokes should have probably got a bigger laugh but they don't they don't film it like a special where it's like he says something and they show the crowd or that audience yeah, member because yeah, yeah. that, that would have made it even funnier because you would see yeah. the awkwardness. Uh, I'll sum it up like this. Do you remember his joke on on that special he did at Creek in a Cave where he says, imagine MSNBC dad, though, because he said he talks about his Fox News dad. Yeah, yeah. His dad watches Fox News. And, he, he's, and he's like, he's like, yeah, but that's he's like, that's bad. He's like. It's not as bad as MSNBC dad. He's like, oh, the climate and all this stuff. (laughs) And I was like, that audience he had for SNL was all MSNBC dad. Yeah, for sure. A thousand percent. (laughs) Absolutely. Well, uh, thank you guys for tuning in, man. Uh, We're going to get up out of here and hit the road. But we appreciate you guys. Can't wait to see you at a show. Uh, Hit it up, man. Chingobling.com. We're going to be adding a lot of cities and ticket links this weekend. Canyon Lake, Texas uh, on the 2nd. Lubbock, Texas on the 3rd. And, of course, next week and after that, Midland, San Angelo. Kobe. What's that number? Oh, yeah, 210-480-8626. Hit me up. I pull up with the Masa Bricks. I don't know. <laughs> All right, y'all, y'all be good. Talk to you later. <laughs>